program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving, let's say this creed together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. Today we're finishing a back to school series about uh, disciples making disciples, training a child up in the way that he or she should go and they will not depart from it. And we're talking specifically about the power of reaching the next generation. Even Jesus' own disciples, the 12 disciples, scholarship believes, were teenagers, you know, maybe early college students. The youngest of them was John, and most people believe John was somewhere between 8 and 12 years old. John was a kid. No wonder he's called the one that the disciple Jesus loved. He was like this little guy that was always with their group. And so today I want to finish with this idea that the best way to invest in the, in the next generation is to simply do whatever you can to be as passionate and bold about loving God and loving others the way the rabbi was, the way Jesus was and is. It's interesting because many of you know I'm a PK, but I'm like a multiple PK. My dad is a pastor, my grandpa was a pastor, my great-grandpa was a pastor, my great-uncle was a pastor. Lots of siblings have been in various ministries. How many in the room, but just a show of hands, is a PK, by the way? Anybody here? What, what the others don't know is we're in an actual club. Nice to see you guys. We'll be meeting later this evening. We have a secret handshake. Now, a lot of PKs, actually, you find, I find that very often PKs tend to have big personalities. And they t tend to be, they have a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A reputation that, 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 that very often PKs end up being rebellious, angry. Why is that? Why is that? I think we all know the answer. It's because their parents, their father or mother, very often is one person on stage but different when they go home. Or even worse, their parent thinks the church and service to the church is more important than the child. And what you find is that very often PKs end up hating the church, hating God, hating everything they stand for. And how many people have turned away from Christian faith because of the evil that people have done in Jesus' name? And yet, I'm so thankful for my dad and my grandpa and my parents, and they really did love the Lord with all their heart. No, my parents are not perfect. They'd be the first ones to tell you that. But I did always believe that they genuinely loved the Lord and they genuinely loved me. Maybe you're here today and you're like, but you don't understand. I loved my kids. I poured into them. I made sacrifices for them, and now they're gone. Are you blaming me? I'm certainly not. In fact, let me encourage you. If you made those sacrifices, if you planted those seeds... I guarantee you that God can use those seeds to turn them around. They're looking to those good memories to help them, so don't give up hope. But all this to simply say that the best way to make a difference in the next generation is to live it out, is to eat the food you're cooking, <laughs> to not just talk about it, but to truly live it, to believe it, to, to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. One great example we're going to look at today is the first martyr in the church, a Jewish Christian named Stephen, who is a part of the body of Jewish people who at this point are still completely Jewish. They're still at the synagogues. They don't view themselves as different from Jews. And how his confrontation with the leaders of the Jewish people is a move to lay his life down, to influence the other young Jewish people there, to see that their leadership is not godly like the men and women who went before them. And his, we've used this quote a lot, that, that uh, this Greek proverb that a society becomes great when its elders plant trees under whose shade they know they will never sit. Tertullian says, the blood of martyrs is seed. And I think this is true of Stephen's life, that his 
life, like Jesus, is like a seed planted in the ground of those who view it. That God is going to use the seed of his faithful act of sacrifice and death to turn the hearts of the young men and young women who are watching. One of those, by the way, is named Paul. Paul the Apostle. Actually, he's Saul at the time and he's changed in his conversion. A little background to the story. It begins in Acts chapter 6. The word of God is being preached throughout all of Israel and God is moving in power. And then there is this thing comes up, that comes up within the body of Jewish people and it says that they're the basket that is being taken for uh, widows and orphans are being rejected or held back from the Greek-speaking or Greek-Jewish uh, uh, widows and orphans. Just a little background to that. In Jesus' day, um, Israel, you know, it kind of looks like California. It's a coastal kind of desert uh, kind of uh, place. And in the first century, Israel is sort of broken up into three parts. Galilee in the north, Samaria in the middle, Judea in the south. Interesting thing about this is Samaria, they are considered the ultimate outsiders and they sort of split the country in two. In fact, you can't go through Samaria if you're a Jew. If you travel through, you'd probably be murdered. But even more than that, they believed that Samaritans were unclean and you just weren't supposed to do it. So there's this wide gap between Galilee and Judea, a walk that can take between three and six days. And so the culture is very different. More than that, 400 years earlier, Jews returned from the Babylonian exile, but not all of them. We often think that this massive group of people came back to Israel, but actually what happened is there were Jews spread all over the world, and they began to congregate in various cities that spoke and practiced Greek culture. One big one was a town called Alexandria in Egypt. It was the center of, of life and philosophical thinking, and there was a huge body of Jewish people that lived there. The other was obviously Babylonia. And these Jewish folks were very prophetic in their faith. You almost might think of them as sort of charismatic types. They believed in miracles and they studied Torah and they were far from the temple. But over the 400 years since the Babylonian exile, they begin to start returning over, over this period of time to Israel. And where is the place they go? Do you remember? Almost all of them go not to Judea, they go to Galilee in the north. And so this group of sort of Greek-type Jews begins to form in the north in Galilee. It also is kind of like a wealthy environment. And the southern part is Judea. This is where Jerusalem is. This is where the temple is. This is where the Sanhedrin is. This is the heartbeat of the Pharisees. And in the south, you might say the Judeans are more, I hate to use this word, it's so loaded, but they're more kind of conservative. They're strict they're orthodox. It's like God doesn't really move in those ways anymore. These are the rules. This is how you do it. And so over time, you see that they all are sort of one nation, but there is this weird divide that's going on between them, and a prejudice begins to develop. By the way, where is Jesus born? Do you remember? In Judea or Galilee? He's born in Bethlehem in Judea, right? His, his, his adoptive father, Joseph, is Judean. But where does he do his ministry? In Capernaum, right? In Galilee. He's, he does almost his whole ministry around that little lake in the north. Of the 12 disciples, 11 are Galilean, Greek-speaking, also Hebrew-speaking, but Greek, and one is Judean. Can you guess which of the 12 is Judean? That's right, it was Judas. Your guess is good. This sort of highlights a little bit of a prejudice that's existing in the story of Jesus and in the book of Acts, and it's important. And so Stephen finds out, or this group of disciples finds out, that the Galilean or Hellenistic style Jews, that the widows and orphans are not being given food, they're not being you know, cared for by the broader Jewish community. And that, this is me saying it, that it's probably coming from the Sanhedrin, which has become very like, only Jews gotta be, can be Jewish and you have to be very strict and very tight, et cetera, et cetera. And they say, you know what? We need to resolve this issue. And this is what I love. Luke points out that nobody wants to resolve this issue because it seems petty to them. It seems silly. The disciples feel like we need to go out and preach. And it actually, Luke says that they say to one another, are we to wait tables? You know, it's very funny. And so they pick a group of seven, and one of those seven to go wait tables, that is care for widows and orphans, is a guy named Stephen. 
And Stephen says, okay, okay, great. Yeah, I'll do that. See, Stephen, in my mind, is someone who just loves people. He loves to reach people. He loves to serve. He loves to be available. And where these other wise men are going to go out and preach and pray, it says he's going to go serve tables. And then immediately Luke tells us nothing about those so-called wise men who are going to go preach. He tells us everything about a guy named Stephen, that he becomes the most powerful preacher among them. The one who was willing to do the work that nobody wanted to do because he loved people, because he, he loved widows, because he loved orphans, because he loved the underdog. That was the one God chose to anoint with his Holy Spirit to preach with power. So the Holy Spirit comes upon Stephen and he begins to preach with power and then miracles start just like flowing out of his life and people are being healed and amazing things are happening. And now rabbis and priests are starting to come and believe in Jesus and this is creating an uproar. And so some people decide, all right, we're gonna take, we're gonna arrest Stephen. We're going to drum up false charges and bring him before the Sanhedrin and uh, we're gonna make sure that he's killed. Now before we get to, to, to um, Stephen's execution, Let's talk about the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin met in a hall called the Hall of Hewn Stone. It's in the temple. So here's the, here's the model of the temple. And you can see this main part here is where the Holy of Holies is. It's the, like the heart of the temple. And the Hall of Hewn Stone is on the opposite side of that wall. So this is facing the temple. It's only a few feet from it. So they're really, really close to like where they believe God is. And this is where the Sanhedrin is supposed to meet. And it's like a courthouse of 71 people led by the high priest, who at this time is named Caiaphas. At Jesus' execution, this place is full of people. Josephus says maybe as many as 2 million people were there for Passover. And they all were really into this rabbi named Jesus. But remember on the night that they arrest Jesus, where do they take him? Do they take him here where they're supposed to take him? They take him to the house of Caiaphas. Now, in Judaism, there are three rules about the Sanhedrin meeting. One is you don't meet at night. Two is you meet here in the temple. Three, you never meet in a festival. Now look what they did. They arrest Jesus at night. They don't take him here. They take him to the guy's house. And number three, they do it during Passover. And it's there at his house they decide that he needs to be killed with nobody looking in secret. These, these are the men that have told people that they can't wear two types of cloth together. These are the men that yelled at his disciples for eating a little grain on the Sabbath. These are the ones who uh, got mad at Jesus for healing people on the Lord's day. And yet they break the written law to murder someone. And after Jesus' death, the whole Jewish community knows it. Everybody knows it. This, this is the same Sanhedrin. The group that, as Jesus said, will strain the, the, the gnat out of a cup, right? But here they are just doing something utterly evil. They're hypocrites. And Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin because the power of God is moving in him and he gives this sort of uh, amazing speech to them. Now remember, the Sanhedrin is made up of 71 rabbis. All of them have the entire Old Testament, the Tanakh, memorized, okay? And he's about to tell them about the Torah. So this is already hilarious. It's kind of condescending as he speaks to them. And there they are. They're gathered in the Sanhedrin. Now this time it is during the day. It's not during a festival. And then there's a crowd kind of watching. They're all wondering, who is this man Stephen? What's he about? I wonder if Stephen, when he was being dragged there, wondered what he was going to say. And I feel that the Holy Spirit told him that the message that he needs to give is not for the Sanhedrin, but for this group of young people that's watching. There would have been children and other rabbis and other really good people who are watching. And uh, Stephen begins to speak to them. And he says, God called our father Abraham out of the land of Chaldeans to make a covenant with him that he would be our God and we would be his people. Everybody listening is saying, of course, we've, we've got the whole story memorized. We could tell you word for word. And then he says, and Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, 
And Jacob had Joseph. And Joseph had 11 brothers. Like, okay, that's a weird way to say it. He says, and his 11 brothers took Joseph, who's considered, you know, the kind of the greatest of the 12, took Joseph. And they sold him into slavery. And they wanted to kill him, but wanted to make some money or something like this. And then he looks at him and he says, you are not like Joseph. You are like his 11 brothers. And he says, and Moses. And now when he begins to speak, listen to this. His face begins to glow. His face is literally, his skin is literally glowing with God's glory. Do you remember, there's one place in the Torah where someone, someone's face is glowing. Do you remember who that is? Moses, when he comes down from us, there's a famous story. He comes down with the law and he's bringing it to his people and his face is radiating because he's been in God's presence. And as Stephen is saying this to, to them, he begins talking about Moses and his face begins to glow. And he says to them, Moses said to those brawlers something, you know, and, and, and they rejected him. You are not like Moses. You are like those two men who were brawling. And then his face closed even more and more. And everybody's like, what is going on? And then he says, and Moses, when he was on Mount Sinai, many of the people made a golden calf and bowed down to that calf. And he said, you are not like Moses. You are like the ones who bowed down to that golden calf. And he said, and every prophet after them who killed every man of God, that God in his mercy and favor sent to us, you are like those who killed them. What is he referring to? Not only their evil against Jesus, but the way they did it. In secret, sneaky, fake, fake, fake. He says, you are fake. You are not men of God. Is he saying this for the Sanhedrin? No, he sang it for those who are following them. He knows these words are going to get him killed. He knows it, but he doesn't care because he believes that he can almost bait them into doing to all the prophets to do that to him. His finishing line is, O oh, you of uncircumcised ears, and hearts. What does that mean? Their hearts and their ears are not of God, that they're unclean. He says, you have rejected the Holy Spirit. And with that, they begin to take Stephen. He says they freak out. They gnash their teeth. They grab him and they lay their coats at the feet of a young rabbi named Saul. St. Augustine says that without the work of Stephen, Saul would have never become Paul. So they take Stephen and they drag him out of the temple and out of the city, which is a long way to drag a person. And there he stands and heaven begins to open up before him and they just start chucking stones at him. They're ready to kill him. And as that happens, it says that all of heaven opens up and he looks and he says, I see before me the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He literally sees Jesus, not sitting, but standing. It's the only time in the New Testament that it says Jesus is not sitting, but standing at the right hand of God. What does that mean? He's standing to honor. You want to hear Jesus say, well done, Good and faithful servant, be like Stephen. Be willing to go the extra mile for widows, for orphans, for young people, for those who are hurting. Be willing to live your full life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you do that, Christ will stand for you as you stand for him. And he says, Lord Jesus, boom, boom, rocks hitting it, spitting on him, throwing trash at him. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Another one hits him in the side of the neck. He falls to his knees, dying. And his last words are, do not hold this sin against them, Lord. And he breathes his last. Final words, love your enemies. 
Final words. Lord, forgive them. Who does that sound like? That's Jesus. Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you want to have an impact on the next generation, be like Stephen, man. Be like Stephen. Be willing to care for those in need when other people have more important things to do. Be like Stephen. Be willing to stand up for the Lord in the most uncomfortable time. Be like Stephen. Do what you're going to do, not not to get at someone, but to bring truth to that third party. Those young people, those children, those kids who are listening. This is how, this is how you make disciples of the next generation. By living with passion and by living with power for those who are to come after us. Maybe you're here today and you're like, Bobby, you don't understand. I'm, I'm, I'm an old person. I'm an old man. I'm an old woman. My kids are gone. My grandkids, they've moved out. I can't have an impact anymore. And I felt so strongly as I was praying for the service between that the Lord was saying, it's not too late for you to have an impact on your kids and your grandkids. It's not too late for you to reach out. It's not too late for you to make a difference for them. Someone needs to hear this today that we think it's already done, it's already gone. But let me tell you, as an almost 40-year-old man, my parents still have a big impact on my life. I think no matter how old you get, your kids are always going to be your kids. Your grandkids are always going to be your grandkids. And if you are willing to seek with all your heart to invest in them, to love them, to care for them, even when it hurts, to reach out to them, to say you're sorry, to be with them, to shake hands with them. Maybe it's not your kids. Maybe it's your grandkids. Maybe you don't have kids or grandkids. Maybe it's the next generation. Maybe it's students. Maybe it's teenagers. But that you're willing to say, Lord, put young people in my life I can pour into. I guarantee you you are walking in the yoke of Stephen. It's the yoke of Jesus. That I'm willing to lay down my own life to make an impact on the next generation. I'm willing to let my own blood be the seed that can plant the trees for tomorrow. When you become that kind of person, you you become the kind of person that when you get to heaven, both Stephen and Christ will be there saying, well done, good and faithful servant. There's nothing like living the gospel with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and watching the Lord do great things in the people you love. Those are the greatest treasures. I mean, I remember Hannah and I, we were having a little worship night with our, I hope it's okay to say this about Haven, but it seems so small, but we were worshiping together upstairs, the four of us. And she said, Mom, Dad, do you ever feel like God speaks to you? And we said, yeah. And she's, she said, did God just speak to you now when you were worshiping? And I said, well, in some ways, but not directly. Hannah said, no, not, not right now. She said, I feel like God spoke to me. And she told us this great thing that she felt like the Lord was saying to her for our whole family. I can't tell you how much that blessed my heart. Everything, I feel like there is no greater reward, you know, than the knowing, and maybe it's not your kids, or maybe you don't have kids or grandkids, as I said, but knowing that there are children or young people or teenagers or college students in your life that are getting to know the Lord personally. That it's not, that maybe it was through you at first, but eventually it's like you're the training wheels and then you come off and they have, they've got it all to their own. They've got it all to themselves. There's nothing better than that. And I guarantee when we finish this life, when we go to, to heaven to be with the Lord, this will be the thing we think about. It'll be the legacy. It'll be the lives we touched, people we impacted. Did we, did we invest in those who will be here after us, after we go. And that's our prayer, amen? Amen. So Lord, we pray for that. We pray for our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. We pray for young people in America today. Lord, we pray for so many millennials in particular that society loves to make fun of, that loves to mock. And Lord, we're not gonna do that. We're going to believe in millennials. We're going to believe in their children. We're going to believe in the next generation. We're going to believe in teenagers and college students and believe that this can be the greatest generation America's ever seen. We're going to believe, or whatever country that we live in, Lord, we're going to believe, Lord, that they're going to know you. They're going to be the type of people who serve orphans and widows. 
They're going to be the kind of people who are willing to lay their lives down for the gospel. They're going to be people committed to knowing Jesus and following him. People committed to knowing the text. Lord, we are asking for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hannah and I are so happy you've joined us in worship today, and we'd like to say thank you for all the ways you continue to support Hour of Power worldwide on its mission. God is on the move and great things are happening. You know, I love the Greek proverb that says, society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. How many of us are sitting in the shade of trees that were planted by a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, or a mentor? I don't know about you, but I wanna be a person like that, someone who is so rooted in Christ that their witness will transform future generations and enable them to know their worth in Jesus. Proverbs 22, six says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In our own parenting, Bobby and I believe it's so important to connect with them and teach them how to connect with others. By affirming the dignity of those around us and agreeing with what Jesus says about them, we change the world one relationship at a time. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we want to send you the beautiful Creed of the Beloved Sun Catcher. We believe that internalizing the powerful truths in this creed can transform your life. Call, write, or go online today and request the Creed of the Beloved Sun Catcher. With the words of the creed etched in glass, this floral adorned ornament will be a stunning addition to your home or patio. This seven and a half by seven inch metal framed sun catcher is secured with a twine hanger for easy display. As you read and say aloud the affirmations that you are not what you do, not what you have, and not what people say about you, your true identity as God's beloved will take root in your heart and you will be transformed. We'll send you this one-of-a-kind decoration with your generous gift of any size. For your gift of $50 or more, we'll include Pastor Bobby's Connect to Cultivate, Leading the Way DVD. In this special sermon, Bobby explains how to develop meaningful connections, the kind that enable you to lead by putting other people first. We'll also include this two-sided Connect to Cultivate reminder card with Proverbs 22.6 on the front and reminders of ways to cultivate relationships on the back. Call, write, or go online today to request these valuable resources and learn to reestablish and strengthen the relationships in your life. The Hour of Power would not be on the air today if it weren't for you and people like you who bless us with their generous gifts. Your financial support keeps the Hour of Power on the air and enables us to make a positive difference in the lives of viewers around the world. We simply just can't do it without you. So please call, write, or go online with your generous gift today. God loves you, and so do we. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you.